before we read God's word, uh, you will uh, notice that uh, it is a little bit more uh, mature in our text today. Uh, and so I'm going to read, uh, and then I'm going to pray. And uh, to our parents in the room who have little ones, uh, you might want to consider uh, taking them down to uh, Little Proclaimers, uh, where there's a age-appropriate discipleship <laughs> uh, there and, and ready for them. I promise nothing, nothing too graphic, but... Um, if you are not ready to have a conversation uh, with your husband or with your little one, um, <laughs> my hope is that you're going to have a conversation with your husband or your wife later on. But uh, for your kids, if you're not ready to have any uh, specific conversations with them, uh, after I read, I will pray. I'll make that prayer a little bit longer uh, so you can take them down to Little Proclaimers, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. Now, in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not a command. I wish that all people were as I am, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has that. I say to the unmarried and to widows, it is good for them if they remain as I am, but if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it is better to marry than to burn with desire. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife, but I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he, may, uh, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or a sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Wife, for all you know, you might save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your wife. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you... Uh, for your word, even in a moment like today, um, I pray, Father, that uh, you would move. Uh, this is uh, a good gift that we're going to talk about today um, in regards to, to marriage. Uh, it is something that needs to be uh, protected. It's something that needs to be uh, fought for. Um, Father, in the midst of protecting it and in the midst of fighting it, um, fighting for it, there are a lot of hard conversations that need uh, need to have. And so I pray right now through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you begin working in the hearts of your people, that we would respond in such a way that would bring glory and honor to your name. I pray, Father, uh, that you would, uh, you would have your way. Uh, let me decrease and let you increase. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, it's in Jesus' name that we pray and God's people said, amen. 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 You guys can be seated. Well, I hope that you guys enjoyed uh, our Rhythm of Rest. Uh, anyone enjoyed it last weekend? Oh, yeah. Praise God. Praise God. You're welcome for that. Uh, rhythm of Rest, for you guys, uh, you guys who uh, aren't familiar or new to Proclamation Church, is an opportunity for us as a church to simply pause and stop, uh, reflect on the goodness of the Lord in the midst of, of uh, his people here at Proclamation Church, but then it gives us an opportunity uh, to connect with each other, Sabbath with each other, rest well with each other. Um, I was able to do that a lot this, uh, this past weekend, uh, and I feel refreshed and rejuvenated, ready to jump back in. And that's what our hope is for you all as well, that you're ready to jump back in into what the Lord is doing here at Proclamation Church. Uh, you know, one of the ways that uh, we believe, uh, well, there's a few ways, but one of the ways that we believe that our, we're calling you all to be an active disciple here at Proclamation Church is to live out your identity of being a worshiper, a family member, us a, a steward and a witness. And essentially what that looks like is every single one of us has been called to live in these things because of Jesus, right? Who he is and what he's called us into. 
Uh, and our hope is that as you take that rest last weekend, that you're ready to jump back in uh, and live out those identities the way that he's called you to. And one of the ways uh, that we believe he's called you into doing that is being a family member. Next weekend, uh, at the end of both of our services, uh, we're gonna have an opportunity, if you are not connected to a family group, to be able to jump into a family group. Uh, we do this thing called Group Link uh, once, a, once a semester where it gives you an opportunity to meet different uh, leaders who are leading family groups, DNA groups, uh, and give you an opportunity to see which group is close to you uh, and ways that you can get connected to that family group, okay? Uh, we want you to live out what it means to be a family member. And one of the ways to do that is by joining a family group, okay? Uh, next weekend, which I'm also excited about, uh, we are gonna have Baptism Sunday um, between our two services uh, we're going to have a total of, I believe, seven people get baptized next weekend. Yeah, you put your hands together for that. Uh, I tell you that because, number one, um, like I said, we're going to have them both services. So whatever service you come to, you're going to have an opportunity to celebrate with your brothers and sisters who are declaring uh, that they are willing to go. They believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save them. They're willing to go and do whatever Jesus called them to go and do. And they declare that through baptism. And so we have an opportunity to celebrate that with them. But if you have questions about baptism, if you're interested in being baptized, would love to have a conversation with you about that. Uh, I'm going to be up here at the end of the service. If you are uh, somewhat uncomfortable with coming up and talking to me uh, in person, you can send me an email, ddelane at proclamationtn.com, and I would schedule time this week to talk with you, hopefully get you into the tank next weekend, okay? Uh, that was a long introduction. Again, just trying to extend time that if you need to take little ones out, you can. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's cool, Benji. You're good. You're good. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I promise. I'm not saying nothing wild. Uh, and I trust your discipleship, bro, so you're good. Uh, well, we are jumping in uh, into 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And like I said, we are in a little mini series inside of our larger series in 1 Corinthians. And uh, specifically, the last couple of weeks have been on, on sex, uh, marriage, and, and singleness. I'm really excited about the next two weekends, or this one and next weekend, uh, because we're going to spend some specific time today talking about marriage. Uh, and next week, we are going to talk about singleness. Now, the reason why I'm really excited about having the opportunity to talk about those two things is because, uh, man, if we, if we can be honest, uh, the church as a whole has done a really poor job. Uh, uh, and what I mean, we have, we have elevated this idea of marriage as being the thing that you must obtain to, right? And oftentimes when the church has done that, those in the room or those who are in churches who are single oftentimes feel ostracized, right? oftentimes feel like, man, am I on the JV squad then since, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not married? Uh, that's not true. Uh, you have value. And as a matter of fact, as we're going to see next week, in the same way that marriage is a gift, guess what? Singleness is a gift. And we're going to talk about that and we're going to celebrate that. Um, but on the flip side of that, our culture oftentimes elevates singleness as this thing to obtain and, and live into. And when we talk about marriage as a whole, uh, it's, it's viewed upon as, as a bad thing, right? And the reason why is because our culture has communicated uh, that in your singleness is where you find the most freedom, where you are free to live how you want to and, and sleep with anyone that you want to, right? And so marriage is a hindrance to, to living free in those ways. Well, I would say what we're gonna look at, again, this weekend and next weekend, is that both marriage and singleness, again, are gifts that the Lord has given us that we have an opportunity to steward well, okay? So as we talk about marriage this week, this is what I wanna say to those in the room who are single. Don't check out, okay? Don't check out just because this is something that uh, you're gonna see. It's, it's, it's super directed to married people, okay? Uh, don't want you to check out. And the reason why is because even though you currently have the gift of singleness right now, you may not be single forever, right? The Lord may, in his wisdom, decide to be like, oh, yeah, here's the gift for you. Here's the marriage gift, right? And so the things that we're going to talk about today is going to be super beneficial for you when you get married. However, if that gift of singleness is just going to be yours for uh, the rest of your life here on earth, guess what? You have an opportunity to come alongside those who are married and call them into what God is calling, in, calling them into as their brother or sister in Christ, okay? So I want you to, to, to lean in and, and listen to as well. And then married people, next weekend, when we're talking about singleness, I don't want you to check out next week. And I'm gonna challenge you in the same way that I'm challenging our single folk uh, 
uh, today because you have an opportunity, as we're going to see next week, to be uh, to, to open up your home, to open up your family in such a way to invite singles in to let them not feel ostracized, which, again, historically, the church has done a really poor job of that, okay? And so we're going to challenge you all in that. So both groups, we all, as a family God, have an opportunity to lean in and listen in on this thing, okay? Again, long introduction, I know. Uh, but I'm pumped about uh, this stuff. So uh, let's jump in. Um, we're talking about sex. Again, spoiler alert, I sent an email last night. Uh, if you didn't get it, we're talking about it again. Okay, so just like we did a couple weeks ago, let's, light, let's make not light of it because, you know, it's a good thing, uh, but it can be awkward. So repeat after me, sex. Okay, good. We feel comfortable saying it? You're not comfortable saying it. <laughs> all right, let me ask, are you comfortable hearing it, all right? Because you're about to hear it a lot, okay? So repeat after me, sex. sex. All right, here we go. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now, in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman. You see the quotations here. What's taken place is the church at Corinth wrote a letter to Paul asking him about sexual relations, and in that letter, he says this. It is, it, they said this. It's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And so Paul now is about to address this entire thing, and the reason why he's addressing it, uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. What was happening at the church of Corinth, they were falling on one of two categories where sex was only for procreation, right? It wasn't for enjoyment at all. It was only for, this, uh, for the case of making babies, right? But then it was another side, it was just like, okay, well, sex is still for enjoyment. And so what they found them, a lot of these individuals doing inside the church is they're going around and they're sleeping with prostitutes to find their pleasure, right? So you had the hedonistic side, you had the asceticism side, where it's like, okay, where are we going to fall in? And Paul is addressing all of this here right now in this moment, okay? You've allowed this, this improper understanding in, to come into the life of the church, and I'm going to talk about it, okay? So essentially, what Paul is telling the people to do here in regards to marriage, okay? You need to steward your marriage well. And in order for you to steward your marriage well, number one, you need to learn to protect your marriage. You need to learn to protect your marriage, okay? How? He says this in verse 2. Let's keep reading. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. Let's keep on going. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, a wife to her husband. So he says, hey, protect your marriage. How? One of the ways to protect your marriage? Say it with me. Have sex. You didn't say it with me. <laughs> All right. How do we protect our marriages? What's that say? Have sex. Somebody better shout hallelujah, okay? <laughs> when you look at marriage, the creation of marriage, it says in Genesis 2 that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. What does one flesh mean? Sex. sex. There it is. Man, class participation. Let's go. <laughs> That's sex, right? A marriage that is stewarded well is a marriage that has sex regularly, okay? Okay? Now, a lot of you are thinking, man, I knew I loved this church. Praise God, right? <laughs> You're welcome, right? This is, this is what Paul is saying It's important here, okay? It, he's saying sex is important for a husband and wife, right? It's good, it's right, it's healthy, it protects the marriage for a husband and wife to have sex regularly, okay? Now, I want you to notice what I didn't say. I didn't say daily. I also didn't say weekly, right? I said regularly. Why? right? The reason why I say regularly is because stage of life will look different for every single person who's married in this room, okay? And it's sometimes it's easy to equate what someone else is doing to your relationship and find yourself, find yourself getting bitter, frustrated, or angry. That's not what's happening, right? Regularly. What that means is there's a level of consistency that's happening in your marriage, okay? And that's something to, to talk about. Now, again, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but we were created as sexual beings. What that means is we have sexual urges and sexual desire, and in marriage, guess what? That's God-given, guys. God has given you those urges. God has given you those desires. There's nothing wrong with having those urges. There's nothing wrong with having those desires at all. And the thing is, we have an enemy that will seek to distract us and pull us away from our marriage to fulfill those things elsewhere. 
And so Paul is saying, hey, you want to protect your marriage? You want to steward your marriage well? Have sex with each other. It's good for you guys to have sex, right? And have it regularly in order to protect your marriage. But then he goes on to say this in verse four. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. We protect our marriages by having sex, yes, but a second piece here is we protect our marriages by being responsible to our spouse. Be responsible to your spouse, okay? Here's what I love about this text. It's not focused primarily on the husband. Did you catch that? It's not focused primarily on the husband. We have to remember the context in which Paul is writing to here, okay? In a culture that elevated men's desires and needs and priorities over women, what he's saying here in this moment is countercultural. He's saying that your wife, women, they have needs as well, just as much as men do. The text isn't making the guy the sexual being in marriage, as oftentimes culture likes to portray, right? It says that the wife doesn't just exist to fulfill the husband's desires. No, that's not what's taking place. Paul is saying, hey, your wife has sexual needs as well, and the husband has a responsibility to meet those needs. On the flip side, the husband has needs as well, and the wife has a responsibility to meet those needs. So what we see here in this text is sex is mutually beneficial. Praise God. <laughs> if I'm being responsible for my wife, I'm seeking to serve her more than I'm seeking to be served, and vice versa. You ready for this? Having sex with your spouse is a God-given responsibility. Praise God. Amen, right? Every spouse in here should be like, yo, if that's the case, I volunteer as tribute, right? Like, <laughs> I'm here for that. Paul is saying that this, this gift that I, that's been given to us by God should be enjoyed in the context of, of marriage. And as it's being enjoyed in the context of marriage, it's an opportunity to serve your spouse. You're responsible for him or her and serving them in that way once you're married. Listen to what Paul is saying. He's saying that you, with your body, have a responsibility to fulfill your spouse's sexual needs. So to not have sex with your spouse is not to fulfill one of your God-given responsibilities in marriage. Now, going back to what I was saying earlier about, about culture, many, does, many don't like this language that, that Paul is like laying out here, okay? Something in this language bothers us because, again, in the culture we live in, as a culture it, that promotes sexual freedom, as soon as we begin talking about our bodies and what we should be doing with it or how we're called to, to operate in it and, and steward in it well, you tell me what I'm supposed to do with my body, that frustrates me, okay? That's not what Paul is saying here. Just like we saw last week, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who's in you, Right? You have this body because of God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. Essentially what we saw like the other week, if you are a follower of Jesus, that now means that Jesus, yes, he's your savior, but guess what? He's also your Lord. And as your Lord, he is, through Paul, right now telling you, yo, be intimate with your spouse. You, you have to give of yourself to your spouse. Plain and simple, okay? Now, how do we, when we look to serve our spouses sexually, right? When you made a choice to get married, you were an individual, and then you met another individual, and now it's two separate individuals, you have now become one. You made that choice to get married, and now your spouse just became number one priority, number one opportunity to serve, to serve in the same way that Christ has served you. You have an opportunity to put on display Philippians chapter two, right? What does it say? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. He goes on to say in verse four, everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Verse five, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. What did Jesus come to do? Serve. He came to serve. Oftentimes when we think of, of service, we think about things that we do for someone else, right? Opening up a door, serving on a parking team, doing something inside the church, right? right? But what is it like to serve in the context of marriage? I told you guys this a couple weeks ago. One of the most important questions that you can ask your spouse is, how can I serve you, right? How, how can I put your needs above my own? In the context of what Paul is talking about now, he's talking about sex. How can I serve you sexually, right? Now, I want to address something here, okay? 
Just because we're called to serve our spouses sexually does not mean that we demand sex from our spouses. You hear me? Just because we are called to live in this and operate in this way, we're not called to demand sex from our spouses. There's an entire section in our premarital mentoring that discusses sex and what it looks like to communicate to each other in healthy ways when you're in the mood and when you're not in the mood, okay? Listen, when we make demands to our spouses sexually, it flirts with the line and can oftentimes cross the line of abuse. And that's not what Paul is talking about here. He's not addressing that at all. In fact, he goes on to say this in, in verse five. He says, do not deprive one another except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. There's a few things going on here in this verse, okay? First, we see that word deprive, okay? When we see that word deprive in the Greek, it means to rob or to steal, okay? So essentially what Paul is saying here in this moment, when you withhold the, the benefits that you have as, as husband and wife, right, without a lack of communication, we're gonna talk about that in just a second, when you withhold those things, you're, you're robbing an opportunity for your, your spouse to be served, and you're robbing yourself an opportunity to serve your spouse. So he's saying, yo, don't deprive one another, right? Then he says, however, there's a time when you guys won't have sex. That's, that's a possibility in your marriage. There's the second thing here, except for when you agree for a time. That word agree in the Greek literally means the, a common voice. What does that mean? Talking with one another. How do you agree on not having sex at that particular time? You talk about it, which means, write this down, you communicate. You communicate. That's how you take responsibility for each other, by knowing where the other person is and whatever season of life that you guys are going through, right? Paul is, is saying the only reason to not have sex on a regular basis is because the two of you are so synced up that you have communicated so much that you guys are on the same page that you both had decided, hey, we, we need to take a break. We're gonna take a break from sex for a period of time. Now, Paul mentions the reason behind this is coming together for prayer. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. But there are a number of reasons that I would take it a step further and say why, why sex may not happen for a period of time, okay? That you and a husband, uh, husband and wife, you guys have discussed beforehand, okay? And this is what I mean by that. One of you guys may have had a really rough day, one day. And it's like, yo, I'm not in the mood. Fatigue, sickness, a busy season of life. Because there could be a number of reasons why you're not intimate with each other but the point behind it is that you need to communicate with each other when those moments have come up. You've got to talk about it, right? Especially when your spouse isn't in the mood. And when you communicate and find out what those things are, right? Paul says, hey, there's a designated time that in those moments, man, hopefully you guys are praying with each other. I love that. Which is actually, that's another way to take responsibility for your spouse. Pray together. Pray together. Man, what a way to serve your spouse. I, I love this, right? Just, just you know, kind of play this out a little bit. One, one of you guys is in the mood and, you know, you try to, you know, whine and dine a little bit, right? Ah, baby, I'm not feeling it. I'm, man, I'm tired. It's a hard day at work, stressed out, right? Oh, man, you know, baby, I'm, I'm sorry. Is there, how, how can I serve you? Can I, can I serve you by praying for you, right? There's another opportunity to be intimate without being sexually intimate, Right? where you're serving your spouse by praying together, right? And, and in that moment, hey, maybe, maybe nothing comes out of it sexually, but you've served your spouse by praying for them, right? If, if I'm honest, guys, that's something that I struggle with. I, like, I, I pray for my spouse, I pray for my kids, but there's times when, like, I'm in those moments, it's like, the last thing I'm thinking is, oh, let me pray for you in this moment, right? You wanna know why? Because I'm selfish, right? Rachel said I could say this, she's selfish too. We're selfish beings. And in, in for those of you who are married, you know, you selfish too, right? I know I'm up here confessing, but confess with your boys so I don't feel lonely. You know what I'm saying? Right? We're, we're selfish people. And oftentimes we see that play out in our marriages, but Paul's like, yo, 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 yo. You gonna have, there's going to be times when you're not sexually intimate. Hopefully you guys are praying together. But then what does he say? He's like, there needs to be a time when you actually come back together though. You guys need to be on the same page. You need to be synced up where you're coming back together. Why? Because sexual temptation is real. 
when, when, I, when, when we're not intimate with one another, when, when these things aren't happening, what happens in my mind? Unfortunately, when spouses aren't engaged sexually with, uh, with their spouses, because we're sexual beings, we find ourselves running to other things. Pornography, that affair, the memory index of, of past relationships, right? We run to those things. And so in those moments, guys, I can't stress this enough, communicate with each other. Especially when there's been a long season of not being sexually intimate, yo, communicate that to your spouse. Baby, I got needs. I, I don't want to run out. I don't want to do anything I'm not supposed to. Have a conversation. Communication is key. Why? Listen, write this down. Communication brings clarity, and clarity limits insecurity. This is what I mean by that. When we're communicating with our spouses and letting them know what's really going on, it limits them to assume the worst. They're not attracted to me. I did something to make them not want me. Those images on the computer, I can never live up to that. Guys, communication brings clarity, and clarity limits insecurity. Protect your marriage. Be responsible for your spouse. And finally, last thing that I want to say when it comes to stewarding your marriage well, I only had two points today and a lot of subpoints. You're welcome for that. Number two, we need to fight for, your, for our marriages. Fight for your marriage. Now, I'm going to skip verses seven and nine, seven through nine, because I'm going to hit on that uh, pretty big next week when we're talking about stewarding uh, our singleness well, okay? Uh, but I want us to look at verses 10 through 16 and seeing what it means to fight for our marriages, okay? Paul brings up the issue of divorce. Look at verse 10. He says, to the married, I give this command. And I love that he says this, not I, but the Lord, okay? He's kind of pausing here and saying, hey, I, I wanna draw your attention to what Jesus says in Matthew 19 about the issue of divorce, okay? So to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, verse 11. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. But I, not the Lord, now he's saying, all right, now I'm given this, this, this exemption here, okay? We gotta pay attention to there. I say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Verse 13, also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. All right, here's the situation, okay? Corinth is, this church in Corinth is, is starting to grow. It's, it's booming, right? People are coming to know Jesus. And what was happening, there were people who were coming to know Jesus inside this church who were married to unbelievers. And being married to an unbeliever oftentimes is really difficult, right? You're trying to, to pursue holiness. You're trying to live in such a way that brings glory and honor to God, right? And your spouse who's not a believer, essentially, not to be like rude or mean, is dead weight spiritually, right? They're not adding anything, in, anything to the equation. If anything, they, they're mocking and, and laughing and scoffing at the, the, wife, the spouse who's trying to live holy, right? And so what's going on in the mind of the believer at, the, at this time is simply, yo, it's a, it, I think I would bring more glory to God if I wasn't married to this person. I, I would be able to, to, to truly pursue holiness and live in such a way that's gonna bring glory and honor to God if I didn't have to worry about this person. So let me divorce them. Let me, just, let me just cut it all out and just be done, right? And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. That's not how we operate, okay? Paul says, even if you think it's better for you spiritually to be, to be divorced from your spouse, you should fight for your marriage. You should fight for your marriage. Two reasons why. Number one, marriage is a covenant union that God established. God, God created this thing, okay? And in this, you promise loyalty and union to someone else until death do you part, so when Paul in verse 10 points back to what Jesus taught on divorce in Matthew 19, that was Jesus' whole main point in, the, in that section of scripture, okay? God created it from the beginning to be a picture of his love for us, and it was to be a permanent union dissolvable only by death. Now again, we're gonna look at this more in just a moment. But the second reason Paul is essentially saying, hey, you should stay married in that situation. Paul explains in verse 14 is that God in his sovereignty has put you in your unbelieving spouse's life for a reason. This is why he says this in verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it, but as it is, they are holy. 
that's a weird statement, okay? Let's acknowledge that that is weird, right? Because it can be somewhat confusing. How does me being married to an unbeliever make them holy, right? Because last time I checked, holiness doesn't come about by osmosis, right? So, so what are you getting at here, Paul? Essentially what Paul is using, he's using a, a Jewish metaphor here, uh, so to speak. When we see that word holy in its, in its purest context, all right, it essentially means to be set apart, right? To be, to be set apart. Paul is saying that the fact that you in your house, you're the believer, but you're married to an unbeliever, uh, uh, an unbelieving spouse, or your kids are unbelievers. If you have, if you've been set apart, guess what? They also have been set apart for a special opportunity to see and hear the gospel in how you live your life. He's like, you have an opportunity to put the gospel on display for that person who does not know Jesus to see it full force in your home, to see it in how you respond to their, their accusations and their finger pointing, to see how you respond in the midst of the gospel when your kids are wilding out or tripping, right? He's like, you have a chance to put the gospel on display for them, and if you were to just leave that, then essentially you leave them without hope. Maybe that's your role in the midst of this. And I'll be first to say, it's not really easy to continue to be married to someone who isn't a believer. But Paul says God has a purpose for you in the midst of that. And you find your happiness in doing the will of God and, and being a vessel of his purposes, even if it isn't the greatest situation in your marriage. But then we see this in verse 15. He says this, but if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. Our brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. This is the clause that, that Paul was given. Remember, he said, hey, this is the Lord that's saying this earlier. Now I'm saying this, and this is what he's saying. Hey, there's some instances where if you have an unbelieving spouse, if they were to abandon you, if they were to divorce you, that's okay. Because you have an opportunity. Did you catch that last line there? God has called you to live in peace. You don't have to pursue them for the rest of your life. Even though we know God has told us, we made this vow before God till death do us part, right? God has still called us to peace. They walked away from the covenant. And that would communicate then that the covenant is dead. God didn't intend it that way, but unfortunately that's what it is now. And so you're no longer bound. So we see that Paul is given this exception, if you will, to the never get divorced teaching. This is why he says, again, this is me saying this. This isn't the Lord saying it. This is me, right? So we, ask, we have to ask ourselves the question then. Are there any other, other exceptions that we see in Scripture? Or is the only justifiable reason for uh, divorce is the abandonment by an unbelieving spouse and what Jesus teaches about adultery in Matthew chapter 19? Well, in all the times that we see in Scripture, those are literally the only two instances, Right? And so let's, let's talk about that a little bit, okay? Let's, let's understand a little bit more about what Jesus was getting at when he talks about it in Matthew 19, because in verse 10, again, we see that Paul is bases his entire argument on Matthew 19, okay? Now, without reading the entire text of Matthew chapter 19, what's happening, the Pharisees, they come to Jesus and they try to get him in an aha, I got you situation, right? And essentially, they ask Jesus, hey, is there any, is there, a, a, um, is it lawful for a, a husband to leave his wife, to divorce his wife for any reason, right? And Jesus responds, no, not for just any reason. And the reason why is because a lot of these individuals were just divorcing their spouses, giving uh, papers of divorce out to people in Israel for any reason whatsoever, right? And so the Pharisees were like, ah, we got you, Jesus, right? Because Moses actually says that it's okay to do it, right? He, he mentions it in Deuteronomy that, that divorce is, is able to happen, to which then Jesus responds to them in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 19. He says this, he told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. He's like, you guys were, you were tripping. Your, fo your forefathers were out here wilding, and you out here wilding too. And he's like, but that, that's not what it was intended for. Right? That's why he says, but it was not like that from the beginning. The purpose of marriage from the very beginning was to be together forever. And so I tell you, whoever divorces his wife, here's the clause, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Essentially what Jesus is saying, yo, if you just out here divorcing willy-nilly, right, without this exception here, and you get remarried, you're in adultery. 
Jesus essentially is saying to them, not only is it wrong to divorce someone because you just want to be out of the marriage, if you get remarried, God actually considers your new marriage adulterous. Wow. But we need to understand this too, at least at the very beginning, right? Since in his eyes, you're still married to that first person. Jesus based this entire argument on Genesis chapter 2. We've talked about Genesis chapter 2 a little bit earlier and mentioned it a little bit a couple weeks ago, right? He says that marriage was designed by God to be a relationship in which two lives fuse into one. Again, we talked about this a few weeks ago, but, but marriage demonstrates the unconditional love of God. It puts it on display. In, in, in marriage, you're, you become one. Your finances become one. Your names become one. Your bodies become one, one flesh through sex. Your, your future, your families, all these things become one. And when you get married, you're saying, I'm binding myself to you no matter how much you disappoint me or let me down. I'm yours and you are mine. And here's the thing. That kind of unity should not just be walked away from. Marriage, Jesus says, was never designed by God to be a contract where you have a buyout option. It's a fusion of your life, their life into your life that makes you single, one flesh entity. That's why Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 19, verse six, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Family, if God ordained marriage and has brought you both together, the let no one separate piece seems pretty important. Wouldn't you agree? And so that means in the good or the bad or the ugly, you have an opportunity to steward your marriage well by fighting for your marriage. According to Jesus, marriage is a covenant in effect until death do you part. But we have to address the elephant in the room. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and also now in Matthew chapter 19 that it appears that there are exceptions. How do we as a church then speak to that? Well, Jesus says that you can do it in the case of adultery. Paul expands that by saying also the desertion of an unbelieving spouse, right? When your spouse unites themselves to someone else sexually, essentially what's communicated is they've destroyed this one flesh covenant with you. So you're no longer bound, you're free to remarry. You don't have to do that, but it's an option. And if your spouse leaves or divorces you, they've killed the covenant. If they're an unbeliever, you're free to remarry. In both cases, God has called you to peace. So I'll say this. If that's you in the room right now, hear me say this. Live in peace. Live in peace. This is what I mean by that. There, there are some of you in here that uh, you are divorced because of something that your spouse has done to you. They've cheated on you. They abandoned you. They've walked out on you. And in this section of scripture, Paul is giving you permission to not carry around a scarlet letter, to not feel like that you are unlovable, to feel like when you walk into a church and you mention the D word, right, that somehow you're gonna be ostracized. No, Paul says, live in peace. So what that means is you don't need to walk around in shame. We say it quite often around here, there's no shame in the family of God. And so if you're in this room and if you are divorced, you have been divorced, listen, there is peace for you here. And that peace is found in the love that Christ has for you. Divorce is not the final say over your life, family. It's not, right? There are some of you on the verge of ending your marriage. Can I encourage you with this today? Fight for your marriage. Fight for your marriage. One of the ways that you can fight for your marriage, even in the difficulty of all of the things that you're walking through, is to consider a period of separation first. I've, I've counseled a lot of couples in my short time of being a pastor. And oftentimes I've counseled couples, hey, it might be good for you to be separated for a while. And I remember telling one uh, couple this, a few actually, Someone always gets, the one spouse always gets super ticked off at me for saying, hey, you, should, you guys should be separated for a while. And the one that usually gets the most ticked off is the one that's in, in the dirt, the one that's doing the wrong. And I was like, yo, 
Yeah, I counseled your spouse to do that. Why would you do that? Because you're a jerk. That's why. And yes, I've called people jerks in my counseling room. <laughs> Act right. <laughs> Stop being a jerk. This, you, this moment of separation is an opportunity for you to realize the error of your ways. That if you have a spouse that, that as much as he or she wants to reconcile, wants to pursue holiness and, 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 and unity with you, if they are willing to take the step to step out of it for a season, that should be a red flag to you. That there's something going on that you need to confess, that you need to repent of, that you need to work on. And maybe the season of separation will give you that opportunity to do that. You see, oftentimes we want to run quickly to divorce without fighting. And one of the ways that we fight is, yo, take some time. Separate. And not only that, while you're doing that, yo, get counsel. So many times we want to do this thing by ourselves. I can't tell you the amount of times that there are people who have been walking with this issue of deciding if they want to get divorced or not, where things are, have just been in disarray in their marriage, and they've walked like an entire year through this by themselves, and then they sit down with myself or another pastor, and I'm like, yo, I'm getting a divorce. Wait, what? Whoa, where'd this come from? Oh, well, I've been thinking about this for a while. How come you haven't, you sat down with anyone yet? You're, you're all the way in cold red when you had an opportunity to be in yellow still, where we could have walked with you and cared for you and, and given you counsel. Guys, if that's you right now, hear me say this. Do not walk in this by yourself. Do not walk in this by yourself. You want to fight for your marriage? Bring the family of God in to walk alongside of you in it. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. Remember talking about the singles? This is for you now, I told you, right? You have an opportunity to walk with your family that maybe you're closer to the situation than maybe I might be. That you have an opportunity to lovingly shepherd these individuals towards unity again. Don't do this by yourself. Before you make any decision, fight for your marriage. Why? Because from the beginning, God established marriage as a covenant. Listen, not a consumer relationship. Two have become one. When we walk away from a marriage because we're unhappy, we who understand the gospel may be at risk at communicating that the love of God comes with conditions. His love is unconditional. Your marriage puts that on display. This is plain and simple as that. Listen, when, when have you disappointed God and he's left you? Oh, I thought so. He hasn't. He hasn't. He's patient. His patience leads to what? Our repentance. And God is doing something even in the valleys of your brokenness, even in the valleys of the difficulty of your marriage. Listen, the world desperately needs to know the patient, steadfast, never giving up love of God. And our marriages are supposed to demonstrate that. Listen, I don't mean to make this devastating, right? The, the, the healing of, of God's grace is amazing in the midst of our marriages, right? And I know divorced people in this church that are experiencing God's incredible sustaining, renewing grace after their divorce. But the gospel is that God can take our mistakes and rewrite, rewrite them with beauty. Again, divorce doesn't mean that the end of your life is over, but the fact that God's grace is amazing should cause us to take lightly the not uh, cause us to not take lightly the damaging power that divorce can cause on us. And that's what I'm trying to point out to us, family. I heard Tim Keller say this once, that divorce is as radical as amputating an arm or a leg. There are times when amputation is necessary, he says, but any doctor would be run out of the practice if he was constantly and quickly saying, well, let's just amputate it. Hangnail, amputate. Sprained ankle, ugly freckles, varicose veins, just cut it off at the knee. Oh, tattoo removal? Yes, we could do that, but have you considered amputation? <laughs> we, we hear that and we're like, yeah, of course we wouldn't do that, right? 
But here's the thing. Amputation is sometimes required. Let's, let's not act like medically we, don't, we haven't seen that happening. But it's radical. That, that's, like, that's a last resort. Yeah? That, that's, a, that's the last thing. After everything that you've been able to do, right? You've, you've tried out everything else. Amputation is the last resort. So then what do we do with all this? Well, I want to speak to all of us in the room right now, okay? We all need to remember the beauty of the gospel. Plain and simple. That when we were faithless, God was faithful to us. And so whether we're married, single, wherever we are, we understand that God has demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And maybe some of you this morning, that is making sense for the first time. You never, never thought about marriage as being a picture of Christ and what he's done for you. That maybe today you have a new understanding of that and that you realize that you need to be in a relationship with Jesus today. Because even in your unfaithfulness to him, he's chased you down and today he's calling you into a relationship with him. So we all need to first remember the gospel. But I'm gonna be a little bit more practical here. If you're married, if your marriage is on the doorstep of divorce, if you're here and you're thinking about filing papers, if you feel that the next step for you is divorce, here's what I want you to ask. Uh, here's what I want to ask for you to decide in your heart right now here in this moment, just as I'm talking, okay? I want you to ask, I want to ask you to consider pushing pause in your heart on making that decision. And I want to invite you to pray. And here's exactly what I, I want you to pray. I, I, be, I want you to be as brutally honest with God as possible. God, I want a divorce, but I want to want what you want. Let's be open and honest with God, can we? Let's, let's not act like that every marriage here in this room is rainbows and butterflies. There's a lot of difficulty in, in the family of God. I know that. But we have to bring our issues to our Father. God, I want a divorce, but I want to want what you want. What does God want? To put his glory on display. To put the gospel on display. And maybe he's wanting to use your marriage to do just that. Make that prayer. Trust in him. If you're in here, you've gotten a divorce and you have yet to get remarried, you may be wondering if you can or should get remarried. Well, if you got divorced based on what we saw from the teaching today, you're free to, to remarry, you're free to live in peace, right? But I want to strongly encourage you to come to next week's sermon, right? Because we're all worshipers and part of worshiping is coming to the family of God on a Sunday, right? So I want you to come back next week. And if you're thinking about getting remarried, maybe you need to hear the beauty of the gift that you have an opportunity to steward in the midst of your singleness, right? That is something that you shouldn't just pass up on, right? There's nothing to be ashamed of if you stay single. But if you feel remarriage is something that you want to pursue, you need to pause and ask if God has had the time to restore your previous marriage. And you ask the question, restore? Like going back? <laughs> like, like going back, right? In some cases, not all, but some cases, yes, actually going back. Listen, if marriage is a picture of the gospel and if reconciliation is a possibility, why not pursue it? But say you want to remarry and it isn't with your previous spouse because you know for a fact that you cannot be remarried to this individual again, but it's with someone else. Well, the next question you should ask is, has God given you enough time to heal from what's taken place in that first marriage? Again, we don't like sitting in pain. We don't like sitting in discomfort. We want, we want to find joy and happiness in a relationship or whatever the case may be, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit next week. You need to first realize that joy and happiness in any relationship cannot compare to the relationship that we have with Jesus. If you're looking for Mr. or Mrs. Right over the, the things and the ways of God, you're always gonna find Mr. and Mrs. Wrong, always. There is nothing that anybody here on earth can give you that cannot be met and satisfied in our Savior. And I know that's hard to believe, right? 
because we're just saturated in a culture that tells us that we should be in a relationship, right? That that's, that's the end goal. No, the end goal is to be known and loved by our Heavenly Father. And we have that and we have found that in Jesus. And so maybe before you make any decision about remarrying, man, has God healed you in such a way where your relationship with him is where it needs to be? Before you're looking to jump into another relationship. There's another group of people. You've already gotten married after divorce. Let me be clear here, okay? The answer is for you to not divorce your current spouse and then go remarry that other one, okay? (laughs) That's not what you should do. But there are three things here, and they're pretty difficult to hear, but I feel like you need to hear it, okay? The first thing I want to encourage you to do is for you and your spouse to sit together and acknowledge together that the decision that you made to get remarried was potentially not God's best. And I know that's hard to hear. You might sit together and ask God for forgiveness and experience his grace for taking a step that you probably weren't free to take. The second thing for the two of you to do is to decide that now that you're married, listen, divorce will never be an option for this marriage. We will fight to do what we need to do to protect our marriage, to fight for our marriage, to make sure what happened in the first one won't happen in the second one. And then when you commit to that, family, walk in confidence that God is for your marriage and God wants to use your remarriage to put his glory on display for an unbelieving world. And then finally, if you're in here, if you're planning to get married and after hearing this, you know it's gonna be a lot of work to protect and fight for your marriage. Listen, don't be scared. <laughs> don't be scared. I, I know that this is, this is hard work, but for, for those who are married in the room, you put your hands up if you would agree with me in saying like, yo, it's been worth it. It's been, it's been challenging, but it's been, it's been worth it. Like, like God has shown himself to be faithful and kind and merciful and loving, even in the midst of some of the most difficult seasons of our married lives, that he's still good. And you'll have an opportunity to see that, right? But guess what? When sinners say I do, <laughs> there's a lot of pride. There's a lot of things that are gonna have to be torn down. But you have an opportunity through the power of the Holy Spirit to protect your marriage and to fight for your marriage. And when you do, God will get the glory. But you can't do it by yourself. You need people walking with you. You need, you need couples, mentors who, who have already been there. If, if you're engaged right now and you're not doing any type of marriage mentoring or marriage counseling, get you some. We're, we're walking through training uh, about 13 couples right now here at the church who by November are going to be ready to walk with you, right? Get in someone's life who's already been married, who's been walking in this season, who can show you the do's and don'ts. And when they're still showing you all the do's and don'ts unperfectly, they can show you that they are pointing back to a perfect father still. And you have an opportunity to model that, to mirror that. Come talk to you, boy. I would love to get you connected in that, Okay. Because here's the thing, when you're making your vows, right, till death do us part, right, that's just not an American statement, right? This is the reality of what you're vowing before God, that I'm committing myself to this thing. And through your strength and your power, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're enabling me to be able to do this for your glory. So take it seriously, but take it patiently as well. Don't rush into it. This was heavy. I know, I see it on your faces, but it's still the word of God. And it's something through the power of the Holy Spirit that we have an opportunity to step into. So let's do that together, amen? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We know that it can be challenging, but you're good, and I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will, will have his way in the, in the hearts and lives of your people. I pray as people need to have conversations with their spouses or with other people in the family of God, that you would give them the wisdom to do that, the courage to do that, to not walk in these things by themselves, to be obedient to what Scripture says. Um, Father, we know that you do all things but fail, so uh, have your way in the midst of these, uh, these relationships. We know that you can do far more above than what we ask or imagine, God, so let that be the case, even in this. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.